Hi gardeners, I'm Lourdes for Native Plant Channel and today I'm taking on the controversial topic of whether it's all right to plant nativars or cultivars of native plants in our gardens and do they actually provide any benefit to our ecosystems. First of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for learning and for all you're doing to make our world a better place by uh, when planning your garden, not just thinking in terms of beauty, but also thinking in terms of providing food and shelter for all our many invertebrates out there who in turn feed birds and other wildlife. I wanted to provide great habitat in my garden for butterflies, bees, and other pollinators. Um, and I wanted to do this in an environmentally responsible way. Um, I've heard from, uh, from other native plant gardeners not to use uh, cultivars, and you've probably heard this as well, saying that cultivars don't provide pollen and nectar and are not beneficial. So knowing that in my own garden, I've had a cultivar of summer sweet or clethra that has been growing there for 20 years. The cultivar that I have is called rosea, and when that is in bloom, it is absolutely loaded with butterflies and bees and all types of other pollinators. Um, so I know that that particular cultivar, there's no way that it's not a benefit to my garden when it is feeding so many living things. Um, of course, I also have straight species of native plants, like for example, anise hyssop, um, which is a fantastic plant and which reseeds itself well so that you can very economically um, fill a space just using seed. I wanted to learn for myself whether using cultivars was the right decision. After all, we're all in this to make things better, so is it a good decision to use cultivars? And I wanted to make my decision based on science and the research that was available and not just on hearsay. We all want to do the right thing but sometimes it's hard to know what is the right thing. So I'm sharing this research with you and I've provided links to um, this research on Native Plant Channel's Facebook page. So if you would go to Facebook, take a look there. I've provided all the links so you could look at these studies for yourself. You don't have to rely on my word. Um, you can see for yourself and go into much more detail. So to the question, should gardeners use native ours? Well, let's start where there's less controversy and where it's pretty easy to see. And that's when it comes to plants selected for purple or red leaves. Doug Tallamy of the University of De Delaware has done um, a lot of research and um, is an expert in the areas um, regarding native ours versus cultivars and just improving ecosystems as a whole. Um, his research has shown that plants that have been selected for red or purple leaves um, are not helpful in our ecosystems because after all, um, native plant gardeners were trying to uh, provide food and shelter for all kinds of invertebrates and birds and other wildlife. And um, if an insect does not eat the leaves of a plant, this would not be a good thing in our garden we are willing to accept or actually want to have um, wildlife or insects that use our plants um, in order to sustain life. Um, so that part is pretty clear. Stick with green leaves and don't use cultivars that have red or purple leaves. Studies, Doug Tallamy studies, have shown that actually humans, um, plants can sustain about 10% damage before humans even notice that insects are eating them. Some gardeners assume that all native ours are bad, but this isn't so. Think about the diseases that run in plants and how cultivars bred to be disease resistant are really helping us. Doug Tallamy's work found that when a plant was um, selected for disease resistance or for a more compact habit or for more upright growth, this did not affect its uh, value to wildlife. It did not appear to have any difference or harm um, wildlife in any way or make those plants any less attractive to 
the pollinators and other insects that we want to attract. Gardeners should plant native plants and try to attract insects if for no other reason than we need it for our own survival. Insects pollinate about one out of every three bites that we eat. In fact, if you take a look at some of these pictures, Whole Foods um, did a, a graphic to um, show us just how important this is. So take a look at this graphic, which shows what a Whole Foods produce section would look like or does look like, and what that would look like without plants that are pollinated by insects. So like for me, I'm a chocoholic. Imagine a world without chocolate. Chocolate is pollinated by a midge, which is a small fly. And in, in fact, it is the only insect that can pollinate chocolate. So imagine what would happen with a lot of your favorite foods if there were no insects to pollinate them. A number of studies have been done that compared the straight species to their cultivars and how they appealed to invertebrates. One of these studies was done by Penn State, which was carried out over three years. It made direct comparisons for at least 12 straight species and their cultivars um, and compared how they attracted um, pollinators and, uh, and insects. Um, this study found that 50% of the time, the straight species did do a better job um, attracting pollinators. However, that also means that 50% of the time, it was they were either equal to or not as good as the cultivar at providing nectar and pollen for um, insects. One example was with the asters, where the cultivars October skies and bluebirds, bluebird, excuse me, were found to be more appealing than the straight species to pollinators. However, radon's favorite was found to be less appealing um, to the pollinators. So it, it was finding that it really depends on the specific cultivar. Often, when we think of plants for pollinators, we're usually thinking of perennials. However, in a study conducted by um, the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station for Rutgers University, and the a study itself was actually carried out in Connecticut, um, the study was finding that trees and shrubs play a very important role, in fact, probably more so than the perennials do um, in attracting and helping to feed pollinators. This study was different from the others because what it did was to actually take pollen samples from colonies rather than just observations of which plants were being visited. Um, the study also found in a surprise finding that um, from July to early August, one of the most important plants was actually water lilies in providing plants for the bee colonies. So um, don't forget the role of shrubs and trees and even water lilies. The question of whether or not to use cultivars in your garden was also tackled by Annie White for the University of Vermont. Um, and she again found certain cultivars did as well or better than straight species in attracting um, pollinators. In fact, to make things even more confusing, Annie White in her study found that Monarda Claire Grace was at least as good as the straight species in attracting pollinators. However, the Penn State study found the complete opposite, that the straight species was much better than Claire Grace at attracting pollinators. So what's up with that? What are we supposed to do as gardeners? Keith Nevison conducted a study at Mount Cuba in Delaware um, a wonderful place which is really dedicated to promoting the use of native plants and he studied this uh, topic as well. Well again he found that it depends on the cultivar. For example the garden phlox gina that I mentioned earlier for um, disease resistance well he found that gina was seven times better at attracting pollinators than was the straight species.
In my opinion, the very best argument for using straight species instead of cultivars comes to the argument of genetic diversity. When we're trying to improve the ecosystem, part of that is just having a lot of diversity. And just taking humans as an example, we understand how some human beings are much more susceptible to certain diseases than others. So the same genetic variation that we want to have in human populations, we want to have that in plant populations as well. So for example, if a certain disease comes along and the majority of people are planting one cultivar of a plant, that disease can completely wipe out that plant. Whereas with the straight species, um, some of them are going to overcome it. However, we have seen that there are cultivars that are beneficial and that are absolutely satisfactory to use in the garden. And just taking it from a practical point of view, when you go into the nursery, sometimes you really don't have a choice because cultivars are all that are available there. So what guidelines can the basic gardener use um, without having to research every single plant, without having to spend hours of research on everything? Are there some basic guidelines? Well, I'd like to provide a, a few of those for you now. The first guideline is to try and find the straight species, if at all possible. Um, this is less likely to happen if you're buying at one of the big box stores. So try to use a local nursery or some of the native plant nurseries, which will also uh, mail order items. Um, so if you can get to a native plant nursery and check at your state's native plant societies, there's a great wealth of resources out there um, in order to find um, sources for your plants. So check those out first. Next, avoid cultivars that are bred for red or purple leaves. We've already discussed how insects that eat leaves um, don't benefit from these. As much as we might like those um, purple-leaved hugaras or uh, nine bark, um, you're not helping your ecosystem by using these kinds of plants. Next, aim for diversity. If cultivars are all that you can find, then have more than one cultivar or nativar of a plant. For example, if you're using rubecchias, then um, a common one that's available is goldsturm. Well, okay, use your rudbeckia goldsturm, but see if you can find some other um, cultivar as well that you can plant in your garden and at least produce some type of variation, some type of diversity. One thing when selecting cultivars, avoid those with double flowers or flowers that have been significantly changed or whose color has significantly changed from the original species. Um, these have been shown to be much less valuable to pollinators. Remember to go to Native Plant Channel's Facebook page where you can find more information, where you can find more on this research. It, the links are there all provided for you um, so you can make your own decision. Please subscribe to Native Plant Channel where we have just a wealth of information for you on different kinds of native plants. It includes garden tours of different native plant gardens um, where you can just learn a lot of information to help you select the proper plants for your garden. Um, I'd also like to let you know that I have an upcoming video on deer resistant native plants. Um, I have a lot of experience with this, living in an area of high deer pressure and trying to provide native plants in this area, which is really difficult. So I have an upcoming video on this topic. I also have another video on um, woody plants, woody native plants to use in your garden um, that will offer you some new choices as well. Thank you for all you're doing to make our world a better place one garden at a time in your own garden. It's fantastic and it's, it's a great thing to do and you'll just enjoy your garden so much more when you know that you are being an environmental steward, when you are um, helping the world become a better place. So thank you for watching today. Have a fantastic day. Get out there. Keep doing the things that you're doing to improve our world. Have a great day.